there's just a lot that goes into making sure that there's authentic representation in games. And we've been just trying to really make, find people across every spectrum to be able to help consult and make those characters be like super authentic to the audiences who feel so represented by them. Welcome to the Life Coach Baker podcast. I'm Nicole Baker, life coach for perfectionists who want to set goals and actually follow through with them. I went to my first personal development seminar at the age of one. Yes, I was quite literally born into this industry. But by 15, I started to implement this mindset mumbo jumbo I'd heard so much about and it worked. As a recovering perfectionist myself, I've been able to set goals that are way out of my comfort zone and achieve them by doing things imperfectly, without self-judgment, and without the fear of their opinions. And now I help others to do the same. So if you are capital D done feeling like a hostage to this a-hole called perfectionism, then this show is for you. My goal is for you to leave each episode with tactical action steps that you can start to implement in your life now. I may be in my 20s. I may have the voice of a sassier Cinderella, but I've been doing this personal development-ish since I was a toddler. So let's dive in. What is up, sweet, beautiful friends? Welcome back to another episode of the Life Coach Baker podcast. Today, I I got starstruck. <laughs> so starstruck today. Um, today on the podcast, we have absolute titan of the voice acting and the video game voice acting world, Julia Bianco Shuffling. She is not only a COO of the Help Network, which we talk about more in the episode, she's also a casting director for video games that you just, I mean, just like top, top, top video games. And she is also author of the book, The Art and Business of Acting for Video Games. I am not a voice actor, um, and but I loved this book. I don't know how else to say it. I read it in preparation for the interview, and there are so many golden nuggets out of it that even though I wasn't, I'm not a voice actor. I still got so much out of this book. I mean, like, and we talk about certain sections of it that I think are so universal, not just for voice actors, not just for people in video games, truly just like perfectionists and human beings of any kind. And that's one of the things I love about Julia. She's so about making this, not only this information widely known, that's why the book exists, but she's also so about making sure you are so cared for at at a human being level. And you can just feel that pouring out of her in the interview. Um, I was actually first introduced to Julia from my client, Julia shouts to you. Thank you so much for introducing us and making this possible. I'm so happy. And the reason I was like, you know what, this is actually a really, really, really good episode for this show is because of two reasons, really. One for everything I just mentioned above. It is so universal. You do not have to be a voice actor or an insane video gamer or anything like that to get an insane amount of it out of this episode. We talk about things like the future of where interactive storytelling is heading, um, perfectionism in the acting and the creative world, perfectionism in her world and what that's looked like. And she really opens up about how she deals with it and how she copes and how she overcomes. And it's just beautiful. We also talk about how she created her book. What was the in what was this experience like? Not only in as a writer, but also being a full time mom and a full time teacher and a full time casting director and a full time COO of the Help Network. And what it was like to start the Help Network. By the way, that's Help H A L P. We talk about the name and the mission in the episode. But one of the the second reason why I was like, I really want to have Julia on the show is because uh, I'd say about four or five months ago, um, I started really opening up on the podcast about being a video gamer, being a big nerd, like loving fantasy and loving um, reading and diving into stories, but not just like just the stories, the lore, the ins and outs of everything. And I was really nervous to do so because, you know, I grew up in this personal development world. I have never seen someone open up about being um, so immersed in something that many people call like distractions or procrastinations or lulls or even being unmotivated. And I hate that. It makes me ick and ill 
because this is a world that I find so much joy in and I find so much life in and it like gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. And finally, after so long, I was like, I'm done shutting this part out of my life and my, in my podcast in the, in the, in the community I've built, because like, this is a huge part of me and I don't want to shut it out because that, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist coach. I don't want to try to be perfect around personal development because that's just impossible. And I hate it when people do that. That's why we have an entire segment on this podcast devoted to how was I a perfectionist this week? Cause I want to show how we fuck up and how we also are human beings outside of the personal development world. Cause I just don't see that enough. And so finally I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to start talking about it and really letting my freak flag fly with it. And you all came out of the woodwork. I mean, like to just name a few things. Like I had clients tell me, Oh my God, you love this game. What, what about this game? Have you tried this one? And like, talking about um, different stories that they love or different things that they've interacted with different stories or video games. And, and it just like, it just, it, it meant the world to me. And I was like, I think that having Julia on the show is the be- most beautiful celebration of, of this, of this community and, and how we can be incredibly powerful human beings, but also still love this fantasy and love diving into worlds that maybe are not quote unquote reality. And I just, I, Julia is just a, a, a titan in this world. I keep saying that because it's so true. Just to give you all a little bit of a backstory, she'll dive into it much more in the episode, but here's why Julia Bianco Shuffling is a huge fucking deal. <laughs> she has worked on a few, you know, little known video games like the Outer Worlds, Zelda Breath of the Wild, my favorite video game of all time, Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity, one of my other favorite <laughs> video games of all time, Medal of Honor, Above and Beyond VR, and Tell Me Why, which is featuring the first playable transgender character in a video game. And it's, we, we dive into this so much more in the episode. Like I mentioned, she is also the author of The Art and Business of Acting for Video Games, which is the first ever industry book guide. Like she just decided to lead that industry and just is amazing. And we talk about so much on the episode. I don't even want to talk anymore. I want to just dive straight in. You do not need to be a video gamer or a voice actor to get an insane amount out of this episode. All the tools, all the exercises, all of the topics we touch on and dive into, really, we don't just touch on it, we like dive deep, are are so universal and you can get something out of everything. So without further ado, I invite you to see a very starstruck Nicole Baker and the incredible Julia Bianco Shuffling. Welcome, Julia, to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. I have been looking forward to this episode for uh, when did we talk last? I think like a month or two ago. What is yeah. time? Um, I want people to know how freaking cool you are. So will you give a little <laughs> background? Who you are? What do you do? Um, well, thank you. Um, I'm Julia Bianco Scheffling. I am the COO and co-founder of the Help Network, which is a creative network of entertainment professionals. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am a casting director for voice and per- voice and performance capture for uh, video games. And I wrote a book recently called The Art and Business of Acting for Video Games. And so I'm, I guess I'm an author now too. I must say I'm not a voice actor I read that book and I I was like I could be a voice actor this is so like not easy but like she makes it so like digestible and wow this is so cool like I'm actually inspired to be a voice actor it's just like your book is I we're going to talk about it so much but it's just it is truly amazing actually I do want to ask you I thought about this this morning what what prompted you? Do you, do you remember the moment where you were like, this book needs to be written? So starting during the pandemic, um, we were, we had just started doing classes before the pandemic in person in studios, just started kind of dipping our toe into how can we kind of help people learn how to, you know, navigate their skills for games. And um, then when the shutdown happened, we kind of pivoted to just free webinars Mm -hmm. because we wanted to give people something to do at home. We knew there were eyeballs. We knew that there were people who wanted to learn, but were stuck. Um, And so we just kind of tried to do as much free stuff as possible. And during that, I taught a lot. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then started teaching more and more classes. And as I was teaching, I, I would put a like PowerPoint presentation together. And every time I would go over these kind of definitions Mm -hmm. and these basic concepts that I couldn't find listed anywhere else and where like the definitions I couldn't find anywhere else. And while my colleagues and, and um, you know, people within the industry all are familiar with these things, anyone that sees sides or, or, you know, scripts from outside um, of games can definitely be thrown by them. And so I just kind of wanted to make it I wanted to stop repeating myself, <laughs> um, but also I thought, you know, it would be really cool if they could read this and then come in because then I can really help them. Yeah. Um, and so that's, it was, it was born in, I guess, 20, December, 2020, the idea. Um, I wrote it all that year, um, 2021. And then, um, then the first six months of this year, it took to like format and get out into the world. How was it writing it since it was already stuff you'd said, you said so many times and you had already kind of gathered and I'm sure you did above and beyond. I know you did above and beyond. The book is amazing. Um, How was the process of getting it all gathered in that year? Um, I think the hardest thing was time um, Mm -hmm. because I was working full time and teaching still. And then I have a a six and a half year old daughter. So I try to spend some time with her too. So (laughs) Um, it was like a lot of early mornings and late nights, but in like spurts, I learned like, you can't really write for less than kind of two, three hours at a time because you got to get into it. Um, but I worked with a coach actually, um, who was someone who helped me with my personal branding and my kind of life visual to the world. Um, when I first started help and, and kind of went off on my own and uh, I just said, I need accountability. I need accountability. I have this goal. Help me figure out how to make this goal happen. And so we met um, a bunch of times and she wow. helped me set goals and, and then just kept me honest by sometimes not finishing those goals. And so the night before we met the next time, but like, that's how it works, right? <laughs> I, lo- oh, I love it. Yes, yes, yes. I want to, I want to now move to the help network, which okay. by the way is H A L P. Can That's you explain correct. why it's help rather than help? So, um, you know, those cat memes where the little cat's like, oh. this is already the best explanation. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my business partner, Tiff and I, we sat in an, uh, in his, um, office at his house for like six hours one day, um, just kind of hashing through names and I'm like a jokester and he's, a very serious. And so we kind of just had to come up with something in between. And I, you know, I think it can, it can be a little bit generic or it can be a little bit hard to Google. So I might do it differently again if I changed it. But like, I I do love the, the name because really we're all about helping people and that's Mm -hmm. what we've done from the beginning. And it's the part of our mission and it's embedded in our name and everything we do. So what is the help network? So people have the, the full scope of it. So we do basically um, production services and consulting for video game companies. And that's everything from like casting and recording and editing, but also focusing on a lot of cultural consulting, narrative design, writing, um, especially an art consultation, especially from underrepresented groups or mm-hmm. specific groups. Um, so let's say you have a character that you're um, doing that's Turkish and you want a Turkish consultant to make sure that you're representing the culture, but also um, you're not inadvertently doing something that may um, be you know, that they wouldn't like. Yeah. And so there's just a lot that goes into making sure that there's authentic representation in games. And we've been just trying to really make, find people across every spectrum to be able to help consult and make those characters be like super authentic to the audiences who feel so represented by them. I'm going to take a wild guess and knowing what you and I talked about on our first call, it's not always been this way. (laughs) (laughs) What what prompted this mission? What made you guys be like, this is what we need to do? Um, my business partner, my business partner Chip is black and I am a woman. And when we walk into rooms in the video game industry, we don't always look like everyone else. Yeah. Um, and that's always been the case because we've been working together for 10 plus years. And so 
we've just walked into like, you know, game audio rooms across the the country and it's not usually anyone that looks like us. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's really, we just wanted to help people get in to it because there's a lot of gatekeeping. It was, it's very confusing. Um, I think uh, Hollywood has like a very specific path you go down to get into it and games has just like exploded and it it's become impossible for people to infiltrate. And so just kind of mm-hmm. a helping hand to kind of get into this industry for people who, um, who aren't able to right off the bat. Why do you think games have exploded so much in this past year? Or not year, excuse me. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Really, really sealed the deal. But even before that, I think, um, it's just a, it's a way that people can see themselves, um, and, and connect with people on a different level and people, it's just like, you know, you make friends on the internet, people make friends in games all the time yeah. and through game communities. Um, there's a lot of, there. it's it's so much bigger than the rest of entertainment now that it's yeah. not even, you know, comparable even with esports and whatnot. So yeah. um, it's exciting. <laughs> One of the most wild things is that before you and I were introduced by client Julia, another Julia, thank you. Shouts out to you. You're amazing. You, um, <laughs> I didn't, ne- I never, it never had even crossed my mind that there were voice actors in those roles. And like, the, it, it seems so stupid. I mean, Breath of the Wild is one of my favorite games of in life. I've logged an embarrassing amount of hours on it and I love it. Um, And there's so much dialogue in it. And yet it never had even crossed my mind. Do you see this pretty often that it's kind of like this, whoa, like, yeah, that's right. It's not just the game design. It's the acting as well. I think um, on on one side, like like your exact reaction is very familiar to me. Like most people, when I tell them what I do, they just like kind of look at me with three heads like, (laughs) whoa, I didn't know there were actors in games, period. Mm -hmm. But I think the harder part has been, that's like always like a novelty and, you know, that's fun. But the harder part is that the other side of the industry doesn't necessarily take you seriously. So when you're talking to Mm -hmm. um, agents that aren't necessarily familiar with games that are like more theatrical or film oriented, um, you have to do so much educating about the standards and like what is acceptable and what's expected and what words mean. And so that part um, is, I wish they would all read my book. I was going to say, do you just like hand them a copy? (laughs) Not yet, but you know, uh, I might have to make like the reader's digest for the agents. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you know, like uh, books for dummies or something yeah. like that. You just say that, here you go. <laughs> like, it's just, I've written it all out for I you. I know. Cause then like, I mean, I know they want to know too. So I try, you know, I try to do a yeah. lot of like one-on-one education. I think that that's just wow. the best way to do things is to make sure that everyone feels comfortable asking you the stupid questions so that it doesn't ultimately, you know, ruin a negotiation or something. One of the things that has just totally struck me with being with you is just how above and beyond you go for not only the book for your help network people for your students for just all this stuff it's it's really it's really really inspiring just want to want to throw that love that little compliment in there Thank you. um while we're talking about like i mean you know the video game industry is booming it's really growing a lot so is interactive storytelling and you talk about that in your book and about the future of interactive storytelling. I would love to have you talk that out on here because I think that this is really interesting. Um, where do you think games, movies, TV, media, et cetera, where do you think they're going to head the, in the next few years with this? I think we're already seeing it all converge. And I yeah. think that's why um, we can't look at them as separate things. Um, <clears throat> they have to all just be kind of ways of capturing performance because uh You've already seen like on Netflix Bandersnatch where they have these interactive, you know, kind of choose your own adventure pathways. 
you're also seeing like interactive or you're seeing like VR style movies. Yeah. So you're and and things where you're in um in VR and like cinematics in VR, right? Um, and now you're also seeing with the Epic Games grants, they're giving out lots of money to um, creators who will create on Unreal Engine. And so Unreal Engine is what's powering the graphics of these crazy animated films now. And they're using performance capture in those. So there's just every if you look at like even avatar 2 that's all like the same style of acting that you're doing for most you know games today so yeah. i just think that the uh the convergence is already there and um it wouldn't be h- hard for more collaboration on things like an avatar movie game experience things you know like there's yeah. just it's just we're not that far from the convergence of all of that will you talk about performance capture for people who have not read your book <laughs> have yes, an entire section devoted to it yeah so performance capture is um is capturing the movement of and and uh voice and a lot of times facial expressions and sometimes even fingers movements and eye tracking um, of an actor or a stunt person on a, a stage or a volume in order to kind of uh, provide that information to animation to apply to the character movements basically so you you translate the captured performance onto a character avatar would like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, would that be an example of it? Yeah. Yes, that's one of the perfect examples of it. Um, also, the Hulk mm-hmm. with Mark Ruffalo. Um, you can see a lot of behind the scenes of him in his his performance capture suit where they actually do a lot of like combo stuff where he's sitting around with the actors in his PCAP suit uh, and they're all just regular, uh, oh regularly God. dressed and whatnot. So um but it it is uh it's a way of capturing performance that is only going to be expanding um mm-hmm. and getting easier to do so happening in less formal places than one of those big stages as well and are, are you watching house of the dragon right now i am not that's okay <laughs> there's a there's a great example of they do like a behind the scenes where this, this guy just like straight up in a purple spandex suit and he's um, portraying uh, a boar that's like coming at one of the main characters and the main character gets interviewed and she's like, yeah, it was just, you know, a guy in a, a, a purple suit and then he's a boar and it's like he's moving like a boar and it was just really weird. <laughs> I need to find that. That is a that would be perfect to share on socials it right now. So funny. <laughs> um, definitely. So it's uh, I think that's the house that dragons built, which okay. is basically like they're behind the scenes. Um, and that's for episode two. Mm-hmm. Um, I go way too deep in that show. Anyway, <laughs> um, I want to talk about the importance because you know this is a perfectionist podcast, and you have an entire chapter devoted to play and fun in voice acting. Um, This immediately struck me as something that definitely is included in the industry and beyond. I would love for you to talk about why did you decide to vote, devote an entire chapter to play fun, the sandbox effect, so on and so forth. I think that if you cannot be vulnerable and play, there's no way to be a successful actor and a successful performer because you have to let go. Um, they're just, it, it. you cannot control it. You have to, you have to embody. And if you embody, you can't be thinking about it. And so I just, uh, I find that the uh, the auditions that are most successful are the ones where you can tell they're having the time of their life. And yeah. even if it's not like a smile time of their life, like you just know they worked their tail off on this thing because they just loved it. How often would you say you see that like percentage wise? 
I'd say every uh, every audition, there's someone that is a, a hand, a lot of people that stand out as having a lot of really good time with it. And also, um, you can tell when people have let it go in a way where they they're giving you what they know they can do and they're not uh, concerned about whether or not that's right for you or not that's my job and not theirs, if that makes sense. It absolutely does. How would you, how would you get someone out of their head? Like if you were coaching someone or something like that in a, in a, either in an audition or in a class and you notice they're really in that, what, what are some things you'd say to them? That's a good question. I mean, I think, um, we try to make things less precious because Mm -hmm. in, in real life and and in these conversations, not everything that we're saying to each other is so precious. And so to make sure that you can throw it away a little bit is a really powerful skill. Um, And so I think you do that kind of, uh, you kind of have to uh, allow people to let go of it a little bit in order to, to get the natural performance out of them. Yeah. I love that. Why do you think that acting, or excuse me, that play is not like the first thing people go to? That's a good question. I think, <laughs> I think like you probably don't think it's as important mm-hmm. um, because it's not necessarily like the, the stuff people tell you you should be doing. Um, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily, uh, playing when you're, even when you're studying it in college, it's still like for a grade and for a, like this hustle culture and things like that. (laughs) Right. So I, I guess there's, um, even like structured, like forced play isn't really play, is it? (laughs) No, (laughs) no. So I don't know. I think it's hard for people also to have the comfort in their um, financial situation to be able to let go and play because Mm, a lot of times when, um, when actors are only acting and then not making ends meet, uh, there is a level of uh, need for this audition to go well. And that alone will add a pressure and remove any sense of kind of fun from the experience you talk about that in your book about i I, i'd actually just love for you to for you to hash that out real quick because that's so important yeah i think it's really important for people to have additional streams of income so that acting is still a joy because there's not many people that can make a full-time living acting Mm -hmm. it's a very small percentage of people and so in order to not torture yourself, <laughs> in order to um, have a healthy existence, I just think it's important to make sure you have, it, it doesn't have to be other focuses. It can be server jobs. It can be whatever it is that allows you to put food on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, but, or maybe it's, you know, a job at Disneyland, whatever, whatever it has to be to, to, allow you to eat and not yeah. have to get your food money from acting and your rent money from acting. I think bonus money from acting is great or no money from acting is a good goal at first because yeah. it's just, it'll, it'll suck the joy out of it and, um, and your performances won't be as good. I love that. When I was um, doing musical theater, primarily in Chicago, I was working as a server and I just remember I'd close the restaurant or the bar. I was bartending also bar one night and I'd be up at 4.30 in the morning next morning, ready to stand outside in the cold for in Chicago in February. But it's like, I I remember so, st- 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 whoa, I remember so distinctly that because I had that income, I set aside a certain amount um, a month for Ubers to and from auditions because I hated parking in downtown Chicago. <laughs> And I was not going to take the train at four in the morning. Um, so it's like just that like little gift that I gave to myself. Like I am funding my career right now. This is like me. Now I didn't know anything about taxes and write-offs. So, you know, that was a whole other thing. But um, 
I, I loved making it like this is funding and very obvious how this is funding my art. Um, so I love that you touch on it because I see that so often where people are like, well, I have to go all in, right? And it's like, no, <laughs> you don't. You can, you really can go gray. There's a gray right. area between the black I mean, and white. I even felt like I did that with the book. I self-funded, self-published the book with my own savings and yeah. I'm still working on that. Um, like it's, but it was part of my like creative expression and my joy to put it out. So I do feel like um, if I had been worried about money for that, it would have been not as good. Oh, I love, I, I love that. That's I'm thank you so much for being so open and vulnerable about that. Um, there was another chapter in your book I'd like to talk about, which was the chapter entirely devoted to the body and taking care of the mind and the body together. Um, I, I want to give you a soapbox, please, please go for it. <laughs> like, why was this chapter, um, so important because reading it even like I'm, I'm not even an actor and I read it and I'm like, damn, I needed this. <laughs> like it was so good. I needed it too. Honestly. Um, I think it's, you know, we only are like, I take my own advice 20% of the time, I guess. Like <laughs> I'm still human too, but, um, I do think that it is really easy for actors to forget that their body is their instrument and yeah. that their voice is their instrument. And then, we do. I mean, part of it also is vocal health is a very, very, very hot topic, important issue in, in especially video game voiceover. And so I just, I needed it to be something that is part of your focus of your career because athletes make it part of their career and act on screen actors make it part of their career in terms of like, gym and clothing yes. and makeup and all those things are all in hair and tanning or nails or whatever the, your upkeep is. Um, that's all part of the job. And that also goes for the inside and, yeah. and the body and the mental health. And I think it's really hard to be in such a rejection filled environment and a place where there's so much comparison in a place where there's, you know, such a small chance that you can actually really succeed. Um, mm -hmm. It's just hard on the, the body and the mind. So you have to just make it part of the priority. And I think the people that do shine through. What are some of your favorite for you personally, favorite self-care techniques? Um, I really like meditating, although I have taken a break from it. I just yesterday recommitted to meditating every single day for the rest nice. of the year. Oh, um, awesome. And I once said, and I think it might be the most brilliant thing I've ever said. It's, <laughs> it's love like, it. <laughs> sorry, I'm such a fool. Um, Please. No, like, I love it. Toot that horn. <laughs> it's it's so like good. a right click and reset or um, organize on your desktop. Like, you know how you organize your desktop? That's what meditation does. It's not like a conscious effort. It just does it. It just does it. You just like, even if it's about something totally different, it like d allows your mind to just have these minutes to focus. Wait, when you say right click and hit organize, I and think I I'm about to have my mind blown. What is this? <laughs> Wait, sort by. It's like right by. click and sort by. So you can do name or size or type or when it was, you know, so you can have all your documents in one space or whatever. So it's just like organizing your desktop with your meditation. That is brilliant. <laughs> that is brilliant. Do you do like guided meditation? Do you do just like on your own? How do you... Yeah. So I used to use unplug that, that app, um, unplug meditation, but, um, I love Chani Nichols has a app who's, she's an astrologer and Ooh. it's a, uh, if you are at all, um, into even lightly into astrology, it's, um, one of the most accessible, incredible apps I've ever had. I had it for one day before I paid for the premium subscription, maybe Amazing. one minute before I paid for the first premium subscription, but she has um, meditations in there daily. And then she also has like a whole archive of her old ones in there. So you can kind of, and then she also has affirmations in there. I listened to one before we started this. 
what was the affirmation? Can I hear it? Um, it was collaboration. Um, yeah, ooh, it was. Um, and what was the name of this app again? It's Chani, C H A N I. Could like feel the listeners being like, wait, wait, what was it? Mm-hmm. I need to go it's back. Like, <laughs> it's seriously one of the best. It tells you about all the stars and all the things, but also like really, she just does an amazing job of explaining what's happening Incredible. in the world. Um, this one is collaboration. I know that being self-made is a marketing scheme. I know that none of us got here on our own and no one builds anything solo. Everything comes into existence through a crescendo of interconnections. I clear space for the most generative collaborations possible. If I can envision the future growth of our efforts, I commit. If I can see that possible partners know how to care for their crops, I say yes. If folks seem more interested in the end result than the process, I press pause. And then it goes on a little bit longer. I like got chills within the first 20 milliseconds of you just speaking. Okay, wait, can you spell it out for me? (laughs) What's that? C-H-A-N-I. Excuse me while I go download that right after we hop up this call. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's been pretty life-changing for me because it's just a, a place to go every day to think about what's happening, where you're at, where things are at. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of tools you use, I would be remiss if I had someone who's so good at audio and all this kind of stuff. If I had you on this podcast and did not talk to you about audio equipment. Sure. Um, because I know at least three people who are listening to this podcast were like, are you asking her about this? So um, what are some of your favorite either like um, uh, apps isn't the right, maybe apps is the right word, um, software. There you go. What are some of your favorite softwares, microphones? Give me the down low. It kind of depends on your level. Mm-hmm. Um, you can start as low as like, I have a Rode NT. It's a USB microphone. It's, um, I think it was just under a hundred bucks and nice. it's really, really, really nice. Um, that's totally acceptable, especially for like any kind of podcasting or that kind of recording all the way up through auditions. Yeah. It may not be quality enough for a uh, professional recording session, but depending on your acoustics, it might be. Um, I use Audacity. Um, Ooh, okay. A lot, of, a lot of people use Adobe Audition. Um, Pro Tools is the most kind of commonly used one in the studios, um, along with Reaper being the second most used. Some people use GarageBand. Um, you know, as long as you can get a... Uh, a wave file out of it, which is a bit higher quality than an MP3. Mm-hmm. Um, you should be good. Amazing. Um, we the studio mics that we use most of the time. Um, the standards are the the Sennheiser 416 or the Neumann U87 or a, te- a TLM 103. Those are kind of the three most common studio microphones that are used on game sessions. Um, and then a lot of times people will use like other random mics or sometimes even like lavalier mics because mm-hmm. we're matching sound from the motion capture stage. If you've been listening to the show or if you're just a living, breathing person in the 21st century, odds are that you're a perfectionist. But did you know that there are three different types of perfectionism? After working with perfectionists for the past two years and being one myself for... Uh, longer than that, I would have to be an ostrich with my head stuck deep in the sand to not realize that there are different styles of perfectionism, each one with their own self-sabotaging patterns. To find out which perfectionist type you are, plus learn helpful next steps that will get you out of those patterns of self-destruction, take the free quiz by following the link in the show notes or by going to lifecoachbaker.com forward slash quiz. Now on to the episode. I want to bring it back to, there's a chapter in your book about representation. I'm kind of full circling, rolling back. Um, knowing what you do in the help the help network and knowing what has happened in video games, where do you see representation going? Um, and what do you think really needs to change in that realm? 
I think, um, I think we're at the level where people are finally looking for the talent, but I think the problem is, and that's like across the spectrum, whether it's like in the game companies, in the art artist chairs, in the um, storyteller chairs, in the actor chairs, I think they're looking for representation across the, across the spectrum. I think where the holdup becomes is that people are saying, oh, well, I can't find it. Mm. And so people are not are just now starting to address the access and opportunity aspect. Yeah. So I I just kind of went to some in-person conferences recently, and it sounds like a lot of colleagues are starting to uh, get more, um, you know, support and money from the bigger organizations to start really infiltrating into schools and places where there may be opportunity to kind of educate um, and allow for more access. Yeah. What, what conference was this just recently? Um, I went to one in Vancouver called the external development conference. And Ooh. it's, uh, basically all the people that outsource at game companies all come together and talk about outsourcing. Uh, so it's a lot of, um, kind of, a lot of art and animation studios from all over the world. And then there's a small, um, syndicate of, uh, you know, audio companies as well and performance capture companies that kind of go as well. Um, and while I was up there, I got to talk to students at the Vancouver Film School about the book and about acting for games. So I got to do both things, oh, which was nice. very cool. You network girl. I love it. <laughs> I just love talking to students. And yeah. so it's just really cool to be able to do that in person. Oh, man. I can't believe I, I don't know this. How did you get into this because this is such a niche thing how did you get into it um I famously got denied a job at Starbucks the (laughs) same day or same week I got a job at Treyarch the Call of Duty developer as a receptionist okay um I was looking for college jobs um and I was a sophomore in school I was studying recording arts and I wanted something in the entertainment industry where I did not have to dress up. <laughs> that was my I love kind of, that qualifier. <laughs> um, and so I got a reception job at this game company, had no idea uh, that it was the catalyst for my whole career. I spent four mm-hmm. years at the reception desk, um, actually three years at the reception desk. And then I graduated college and they made a job in the sound department for me because I had spent, you know, three years working my tail off at reception and then and, and networking in the sound department. Nice. Uh, and when I went into the sound department, um, it was early days where there weren't people dedicated to dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we had uh, we had a game that we were making and they didn't have anyone that was like organizing the script or the session or anything like that. And it was basically, it was one of the sound designers jobs and they just kind of handed it over to me and said like, here's an Excel sheet. Good luck. And, uh, and I kind of just learned my job, created my job. We all figured it out together and started, um, managing the script, managing audio assets, editing audio assets, sitting in all the recording sessions, getting things into the game, um, working crazy hours. And then uh, finally, after five years of uh, being there, I left because I couldn't really handle the the dev schedule anymore. And I didn't really want to be I knew that wasn't going to be my future because I didn't knew I eventually wanted to have a family and the hours are not conducive to that. Is that changing or is that still very much a part of the video game development culture? Um, I think it is changing. And I think it's um, with so many more games coming out, there's less kind of focus on one date where everything has to be out. Yeah. Uh, And so I think that's helped. And I think the pandemic kind of shifted that even more is like a kind of any time is a good time to release a new (laughs) game as long as it's a good game. Wasn't Um, it? Do I remember correctly? Wasn't Animal Crossing kind of just like they like released it in like a a random day and then it just happened to be like right at the beginning of the pandemic? Yes. And then it, I I totally bought that game. I've also logged an embarrassing (laughs) video. Totally. Um, Oh my gosh. That's, 
That's crazy. I want to know before we ask, before I go to segments, what are your favorite video games to play? And what has been your favorite video game or video games to work on? So I, right now, well, I've always been a Nintendo girl. I love Nintendo. I play a lot of those games. And um, right now I'm playing a game that I actually worked on. Um, which is called Wildflowers. And okay. it is one of my favorite games I've ever worked on. Um, it won the Apple Design Award last year for inclusivity. The team did an amazing job at being representative, but also having like um, just a kind of mature, but not mature story. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just like, it's like Animal Crossing with witches and farming. Say no more. <laughs> it's, it's, and the voice acting, they 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 hired um, AAA voice actors, and they they pr- produced it like a AAA game, and it it is worth it because wow. of it. Like the sound is amazing, the the actors, the voices are so good, and so I like. It's the first game that I've made that I like really play. Interesting. Um, just because of time and all of the things, it's like a really easy one to just pick up. I, I mm-hmm. played a lot of it on my phone because it came out on iOS first, but oh, it okay. just came out on the Switch like a, a week ago. And I've been playing it ever since. Because You also know I'm about so to go buy that right after this. You right? should. I, like, I, it's, it's so fun. Oh, <laughs> it's so fun. It's a really good one. Um, And then I think most important to me is tell me why um Mm -hmm. it was just a really significant project featuring the first um playable transgender character in a video game and uh, it also just introduced me to this incredible community of trans actors that I just never would have known about it just I just went down so many kind of research paths I got a really great relationship with GLAAD and their transmedia organization and and it's just it's been an amazing addition, uh, to be able to, um, now have access to all these actors and talents. So, so people know truly how big of a deal you are. Can you list off a few of the the video (laughs) games you've also, a few more of the video games you've worked on? I am very excited to say that I did all of the performance capture casting for Gotham Knights which was uh, right before the pandemic. And um, I managed to work with the incredible team um, at Warner Brothers Montreal to cast four uh, four non-white leads for the four um, uh, bats, (laughs) Batman and Robin, or it's not Batman, but it's um, Nightwing and Red Hood and Batgirl. And uh, so, yeah, we're just... I was just really thrilled with the amazing talented actors that they chose and the representation that was able to get into that game. And you said that's been a project since 2020. Did I hear that? Wow. Yeah. Uh, when did the shutdown happen? March, 2020. Wasn't it 2019? It was 2020? It was 2020. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't do math. Yes. Okay. 2020. Yeah. So I, it was January, 2020, wow. December, 20, December, 2019, January, 2020 that I cast that. Is that pretty typical? You work on projects for that long? Mm-hmm. I, 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 I haven't touched it since. Oh, okay. Got it. Mm-hmm. So I just been waiting. <laughs> oh, my God. cause you, I, I'd like for people to know like your NDA, you're, you're not allowed to basically say because yeah, don't you have like code words and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, there's co- all sorts of code names. I can't talk about anything I'm working on because most of the stuff I'm working on now doesn't come out till 24, 25. Oh, wow. Okay. So the, Can I the ask stuff if you're working coming... on Breath of the Wild too? <laughs> you're, you can't, you probably can't answer that. <laughs> Never mind. I don't think anyone in the world would say yes to that question. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Um, okay. I want to move on to segments because you've just been such a delight. You've given us so much wealth of knowledge. Um, I always ask guests two questions. The first is what is a small step you've made towards achieving your goals this week or this month? I, that is today is such an interesting day for that question. I Mm -hmm. was personally neglecting some self-care in terms of like bumping up my schedule a little bit too tight 
for the things that I have going on. And my body yelled at me this weekend and I moved a bunch of things around and I went to the doctor yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that like, it seems like not a big deal, but it's a huge deal because I have my husband's out of town on a work trip. My daughter's at school, you know, just all of the pieces. I'm, I'm the boss. I was out of town, all of the things. Yeah. Um, but I actually said, you know what, everyone, I'm going to take two hours and go to the doctor and take care of myself. And I'm really, really proud of myself for doing that. That's amazing. (laughs) One thing that we haven't really discussed is your relationship with perfectionism. Yes. Um, Can you give everyone a little, little backstory of what that's been like? Yeah. So um, my mother used to say perfect was her favorite word. Oh, (laughs) oh dear. (laughs) So there you go. (laughs) Podcast done. (laughs) Um, I have adopted done is better than perfect. I love it. Um, because I do suffer from perfectionism from birth. And uh there was definitely um a lot of pressure to high achieve. Yeah. And I think I have really shed a lot of that in my um, I think in my like maternal years, like as a mother. I think it's something that's allowed me to, we have a philosophy, my daughter and I, where it's just like, not a big deal. Nothing is a big deal. It really isn't. And sometimes that's bad because at Christmas this year, she was helping us hang ornaments and one after another, they kept crashing down (laughs) and each one is like more significant than the next but she's being so helpful. So there's a balance between, you know, it's not a big deal. And sometimes it is. Um, but really, I, I really try not to, to get too caught up in the perfect anymore, or that book never would have come out ever, ever, ever. Was there a moment or a series of moments where it was like, no more, I cannot do this anymore. I have to change this way of thinking. I think that's what motherhood does Yeah, because you lose control, like as a control freak, as a, someone who, you know, wants to control things, you just literally can't, <laughs> they just like throw that in your face. Um, and I think <laughs> sometimes it's literally. a better boss too, just because mm-hmm. I'm, I don't have to control how people do things. And I used to mm-hmm. be like a lot more like um, specific about how someone would achieve a goal. And I'm a lot more flexible about like, yeah, I might not have sent that email that way. And yeah, I might not have gotten to that end goal that way, but we all got there, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's been such a great pro- <laughs> progression of, of <laughs> life because it's a, it's a lot easier to live that way. Yeah. Which brings me very perfectly to my next question. How were you a perfectionist this week? (laughs) Was I a perfectionist this week? Or how did perfectionism rear its its head? If it did. Yeah. I mean, I I let go of it. I had to because my body made me. I was at a... um, uh, I was at a actor retreat that we put on. And I... uh, At one point wasn't feeling great and had to go with it. (laughs) And so even though I was the most senior person there and kind of in charge and, you know, I'm sure a lot of the actors want to spend time with me and feeling all sorts of pressure on every single side of that. But, um, but the, I was very honest about it and I think more so than I've ever been in a public setting, um, in a way that it, you know, everything, everyone, I think, um, felt like I was human and so did I, and that was good. (laughs) Wow. The amount of bravery and courage, I feel like that takes is so astronomical, but that is courage. That is so infectious. That is amazing. Thank you. Uh, You're so wonderful. I'm so glad we got to talk. I know it's been a pleasure. I want everyone to follow the fuck out of you. Where can they go? <laughs> I'm at Julia BS Casting on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. 
And then um, my website is just juliabs.com and the casting stuff is all on juliabs.com slash casting. And where can they get your fun? I, literally, I cannot say how much I enjoyed your book. Like I blew yeah. through it because it's just like, this is, I, it is highlighted so crazy and I'm not even a voice actor. I, love it. <laughs> like, it's I so do good. feel like there's a lot that I c- can apply to creatives um, in general. Absolutely. Um, uh, you can get it. I, I prefer that you get it on bookshop.org, which is a place where you can shop through your local or favorite bookstore. Um, you can also get it on Amazon or target barnesandnoble.com. Um, and it's available in ebook. I am working on the audiobook version, but I need time. Are you <laughs> audio booking it? I am. I am Amazing. narrating it. Um, hopefully by the time this comes out, it'll be out. Oh my gosh. That, that that's would be, very... that would be cool. I've, I've only gotten through about a third of it so far. Doing so an audiobook it. is a beast. I, I did one for my, um, my parents, really good friend wrote a book like 10 years ago and she was doing a revamp of it and she was actually on the podcast and I did her audiobook last year and I was like, you know what? This should be good. This will be fun. I have dyslexia. It's going to be great. <laughs> like this will be fun. And, um, whoa boy, did I not know <laughs> I think (laughs) the biggest surprise was having to Google things. Yes. Because it's my book. (laughs) I had to Google how to say things because I only ever wrote it. Yeah. And what's like one of the words or phrases you had to Google? I can't remember. I think it was some of, because the beginning I do the history. Mm -hmm. I think it was some of like the old company names and old game names where it's like a little bit (laughs) weird. Yes. And so I had to Google a few of those and like, and then a few times you're like, well, I hope this is right. I'm sure the internet will tell me when it's wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was funny. I did not ha- expect to have to like Google my own work. So How funny. Oh my gosh. You're a delight. Thank you so, so much, Julia. I so appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. I mean, she's amazing. I just, I'm so grateful. Julia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. If you are a voice actor or you're wanting to dive into the voice acting world, get her book. I'm not even a voice actor and I loved it. I loved it. It is available literally anywhere you can get books and I'll put the link in the show notes as well. Um, But just it's phenomenal. And even if you're not a voice actor and you're just like a creative and you want to know different ways that you can interact with industries and also take care of your body, there's so much around that in this book. Get your hands on it. It's phenomenal. And just thank you, thank you, thank you again, Julia, for being on. This was just so special. I want to say one quick thing before we wrap up the episode, and that is um, it's that sweet, sweet time of year where we all get our Spotify wraps. And if you guys didn't know, as a podcast creator, um, if you create on Spotify's podcasting platform, which I do, you get a wrapped for your podcast. And I received my rap this morning and I found out that on Spotify, we are in the top 15% of most followed podcasts. And I started weeping, just straight weeping. This is a true testament to you all. It was sharing things like it was, it was one of the top, I think it was also the top 15 most shared podcasts of the year. Um, the show has grown almost 98% this year. I mean, like, I'm just, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. And just before I just start absolutely crying, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is such a testament to you all and, and how much you are, are giving into the show as much as I am and sharing it and listening to it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm so grateful. I love you all. I hope you know that every single week. I just, I, pour out in love so much to you all. And you are just incredible. You are absolutely incredible people. And I hope to keep this going and just keep growing and keep it just absolutely, absolutely amazing. And I just, I, I love you. I'm going to keep gushing. So I hope you all have an amazing week and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Life Coach Baker podcast. Don't forget to go take the free quiz and find out what perfectionist type you are by visiting the link in the show notes or by going to lifecoachbaker.com forward slash quiz. Also, take a moment to rate the podcast and write a review. It is the best way to get the word out there. 
Plus, you'll get the chance of having your review read on the show. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.